and we'd like to get things moving. I'm Paul Cullis. Um, I'm Chief of Neurology for Ascension Health Michigan and also President of the Michigan Parkinson's Foundation. Uh, and as such, I have the great pleasure of working with Mary Sue on projects like this, and she is really fantastic at organizing these events. Um, I have the pleasure this morning of introducing Dr. Edwin George. Dr. George has been working with us at the Parkinson's Foundation for many years. He's director of the Wayne State University Movement Disorder Center and also director of the Movement Disorder Clinic at John Dingle Medical Center in Detroit. He's on the Movement Disorder Strategic Planning Committee of the American Academy of Neurology and is co-director of the Neuropathophysiology Curriculum for Wayne State University School of Medicine. He's a member of the Board of Directors of the Parkinson's Foundation and a, uh, a member of the Parkinson's Foundation's Medical Advisory Board. He's a very well-known movement disorder neurologist and has been very, very instrumental in helping uh, uh, forward the goals of the Michigan Parkinson's Foundation. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to have him uh, speaking for us here today on navigating late stage Parkinson's disease and um, I'd like to introduce him. Thank you. Thank you, it's great to see so many people here today. Uh, and I guess I saw quite a few more people sitting there on the highway as I snuck past to get in here. Uh, let's see. So after that great introduction, here are the slides for uh, care and treatment of late stage Parkinson's disease. There are uh, a number of issues that become increasingly important as Parkinson's disease progresses. Uh, balance and falls being one of the major challenges uh, as Parkinson's progresses, but also orthostatic hypotension, uh, a tendency for the blood pressure to drop when you're on your feet becomes more important. Eventually, memory problems and hallucinations can become big issues. Uh, motor fluctuations as the disease progresses becomes harder and harder to keep the motor symptoms, the ability to move under close control. Uh, and swallowing problems begin to arise. And eventually you have to think about long-term and hospice care. So uh, first, balance and falls. One of the key things here is to do a home safety evaluation. You can actually get uh, checklists of things to, to look for around the home. You wanna make sure because of balance and falls being such an issue, you remove any sort of tripping hazards, you know, watch out for loose rugs, electric cords strung across areas you might walk through, any sort of clutter. Um, you wanna make sure there's adequate lighting everywhere and you wanna make sure there are railings on all the stairs and in fact, ideally railings on both sides of stairs. <clears throat> you can also have an occupational therapist help to check out the home and make specific recommendations such as adding grab bars in the bathroom. Now, <clears throat> as you can see on the left part, grab bars in the bathroom look like this. They don't look like these other bars in the bath that you can see to your right. That, that won't help your balance. <clears throat> Other issues that come up as the balance reflexes begin to deteriorate and people have more trouble maintaining their balance is use of assistive devices such as canes and walkers. Uh, straight canes are often the thing that people go to first. Straight cane is really good for reducing the load on one leg. It helps with injuries and joint problems, but they really do a very limited amount to help you maintain your balance. Quad canes are much better that way. They provide more stability. They have more, <clears throat> they're more useful when balance is the issue as in advanced Parkinson's. So a quad cane is one of those canes with multiple feet, not always four feet, and it can, some of them have only three but they're still much more stable than just a straight cane. Um, <clears throat> training in the best use of the cane by a therapist can also be very helpful. Sometimes what seems to come naturally is not really the best way to maintain your balance. 
Walkers are also a big issue. You see walkers like these basic walkers all the time. Uh, these are often difficult for people with Parkinson's to use well. Um, if you don't have any wheels, you have to pick it up and move it. Um, they're not, they don't provide all that much stability. If you're leaning forward on the walker, you're more stable. But it won't help you if you start to lose your balance to the side or backwards. They're lightweight enough. You, I occasionally see people ending up lying on their back, holding the walker up in the air. Um, again, these are very good for if you've had a hip replacement or you have bad arthritis for just getting weight off the limbs. But for balance, you really want something like one of these two. The most common thing you see are these rollators. Um, they're certainly easier for those with Parkinson's to use, and they provide a lot more stability side to side, and some stability even for falling backwards because there's enough weight there to uh, help keep you from losing your balance backwards. They can get away from you by rolling too easily. They have handbrakes, but you have to squeeze the handbrakes to, to make it slow down and stop. Most of them have handbrakes that can be set to lock it in place, but that's something you have to specifically do while you've got your balance, not something you can do when you lose your balance. On, in contrast, the other one here, the U-step type, is really designed for Parkinson's people. Uh, <clears throat> it has handbrakes, but they're reverse action. You have to squeeze the brakes in order to go forward. So if you just lose your balance and grab hold of the walker somehow, the locker will be locked in place because you're not squeezing the handbrakes. Uh, it has much more stability. You see the U-shaped base even has a couple of wheels that get back a little bit behind you to help you from falling backwards. And the big gray wheels you can sort of see there have a variable resistance you can set on it. So you can make it roll easily enough, but not too easily that it gets away from you. Um, Now, of course, if you get beyond uh, use of walkers, we get into uh, wheelchairs and particularly power mobility. And here you have to think about there are really two choices. You get things that are basically power wheelchairs. They're small, they're compact, they can pretty much pivot in place. They're very maneuverable if you're going to be getting around indoors um, using power mobility, but they're not as great if you have to go out on a sidewalk or, or outside. Power scooters, on the other hand, um, are big and not so maneuverable. They're easier to drive. They've got handlebars that you steer with instead of a little joystick. Um, <clears throat> so they can be good if you want to take it to the mall and go long distances across the parking lot, but they're not so good for maneuvering in the home. So you have to think about what you're going to use it for and uh, make sure that you choose the right device. And at this point, you also need to think about further issues with home sa safety. One thing is hospital beds are very important. People with Parkinson's have a lot of trouble adjusting their position in the bed, which can lead to all sorts of problems. And a hospital bed can help you to uh, adjust things easily. Um, in addition, you can get a trapeze bar. It's possible to set up a trapeze bar for a non-hospital bed, but hospital beds generally have a bracket and a place specifically to attach it. And what that is is a little bar, often a triangle, that hangs over the bed that you can reach up and grab to help you sit up, to help you move from side to side, to help you turn. Um, which can be very difficult for people with Parkinson's, particularly at night when medication tends to be wearing off and makes mobility even more difficult. And again, DME is durable medical equipment, things like grab bars specifically in the bathroom, but in other places. In some cases, you want to do things like uh, adjust what type of uh, knobs and handles you have on doors and things like that. So as things advance, you need to uh, keep these in mind. So moving on, another reason why people sometimes fall is orthostatic hypotension, which basically means your blood pressure drops, hypotension, uh, low pressure, and uh, orthostatic standing upright. Uh, 
if you can say it in Greek, you've got a medical diagnosis. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this you want to think about, particularly if somebody starts having falls despite having pr still pretty good balance, or falls that are not due to trip and overbalance. Particularly if somebody's falling while using a walker, assuming they've got an appropriate walker and they're <clears throat> using it properly, uh, you want to be suspicious because if you start to get lightheaded or you pass out, no walker is going to reach out and grab you. You have to be able to hold yourself up. So the trick is there's not always a clear history of lightheadedness. And sometimes uh, people will talk about just feeling generalized weak all of a sudden I felt weak all over or I suddenly felt very tired and when the next slide we'll go into more symptoms that can come up 18% of people with Parkinson's have symptomatic orthostatic hypotension so this is a very common problem and as I mentioned it gets uh, more common as the disease progresses and formally it's defined as a sustained drop in the systolic blood pressure of greater than 20 millimeters of mercury or the diastolic, the lower number of more than 10 millimeters of mercury within three minutes of standing. And one thing that uh, some uh, medical care workers uh, forget is that it doesn't necessarily happen right away. Often people stand up and they feel lightheaded or dizzy immediately and you'll see that their blood pressure has gone down. But a lot of times people will get a lying blood pressure, a sitting blood pressure, and a blood pressure after one minute of standing. You need to, after one minute of standing, you need to stand another two minutes, check the blood pressure again because in some people there's a delay before the blood pressure actually drops. So this slide is about the symptoms of orthostatic hypotension. And again, on the top left, you see dizziness, lightheadedness, presyncope, which is you feel like you're about to pass out, syncope, you actually pass out. Um, <clears throat> these things uh, on the uh, other side of the slide, it mentions impaired vision. Your vision begins to sort of gray out, particularly around the edges. And these are common symptoms that people usually recognize as being about to pass out. Um, but you can also suddenly have difficulty concentrating, a sudden headache uh, that comes after standing up. You can get just uh, poor cognition, which is so somewhat similar to difficulty concentrating. You just can't think straight. But you can also get other things. Some people, they're not getting enough blood flow not only to the brain but to the lungs, and they get short of breath or they get uh, not enough blood flow to the muscles, particularly in the upper half of the body, and they suddenly get aching pains in the muscles, particularly in the shoulders. Uh, and this is sometimes called uh, coat hanger ache because you get up and suddenly you just don't feel right, maybe a little weak, and you get this aching in your shoulders. That can be a sign that the blood pressure is dropping. But then you can get uh, problems with chest pain. You're having trouble maintaining your blood pressure. And very nonspecific symptoms like the generalized weakness, uh, the falls themselves may be the only sign, or you may feel lethargy or fatigue or sometimes nausea. So you want to be aware of symptoms that come particularly shortly after standing up from sitting or lying and think about, could this be orthostatic hypertension? Now, there are a bunch of things you can do about orthostatic hypertension uh, short of taking medications for it. And first of all, we're always advising people get up slowly, stay in place for a minute before walking. If you're still standing in front of the chair or the couch you got up from and you get too lightheaded, you can always sit down again. If you've walked three steps away, you're going to fall on the floor. Um, so take it easy when you get up and get started moving. Increased salt and fluid intake. More volume in the body helps to keep the blood pressure up. You spend most of your life trying to avoid salt so you don't get high blood pressure. Now the problem is low blood pressure. You want salt. <laughs> so uh, keep the bed in reverse Trendelenburg. Uh, Dr. Trendelenburg gave his name to a number of things, one of which is uh, tilting the bed one way or another. Reverse Trendelenburg is head slightly up. And you want the head particularly above the feet. 
So if you've just got a bed that's bending in the middle like a standard hospital bed does, um, that helps a little bit, but that's only the upper part of the body. Ideally, you'd like the whole bed to have a slight slope from head to foot. And often it helps to put something that's uh, two to four inches under the feet at the head of the bed, just to give it that little bit of a slope. If you lie completely flat, your blood vessels get really relaxed and they need to tighten up to keep your blood pressure up when you get up. If you've got that little bit of slope, it helps to keep the vascular tone. It also prevents the kidneys from saying, oh, we've got way too much fluid now and uh, trying to get rid of all that fluid that's helping to keep your blood pressure up. Uh, it also, because your body has natural <clears throat> changes to try and maintain the blood pressure, uh, when you lie down, if you lie really flat, your blood pressure can go too high, even though it's low when you're up on your feet. And this uh, little bit of slope will help to prevent that. Other things you can do, avoiding large meals and excessive caffeine use. Um, large meals, suddenly your gut is taking as much of the blood supply as it can get, and there's less for the rest of your body, including your head. So that will exacerbate any sort of tendency of the blood pressure to drop when you stand up. Caffeine will also exacerbate the problem. And then you can wear compression stockings and an abdominal binder. The problem that's going on is really your body has reflexes to tighten up the blood vessels and keep the blood from running to your lower extremities when you stand up. And those reflexes aren't working well. So if you can give them some help by keeping some tightness from the outside, then you can maintain your blood pressure better when you get up. Now, if those things don't work, we do have a variety of medications that can really help to maintain the blood pressure when you get up. And uh, often we end up using two or three of these in combination. They come in uh, a couple of different sorts. Uh, fludrocortisone, better known as Florinef, and uh, Desmopressin, sometimes called DDAVP or Vasopressin. Um, these are things that help, again, to keep the volume up. Uh, the fludrocortisone just tells your kidneys hang on to salt and water. Uh, so they'll hang on to more than usual. And the desmopressin also tells the kidney, don't make as much urine. So it keeps your volume up. They have a disadvantage in that they're relatively slow mechanism. Once your volume's up, it's up. You lie down at night, your blood pressure can be too high. So you have to balance these to uh, try and get uh, a good effect without too much problem. You also have to watch out fl overloading with fluids will cause congestive heart failure. So if somebody doesn't have a really strong heart as well as having Parkinson's, you can't uh, be uh, too uh, aggressive with these sorts of medications. Other medications really help to deal with this idea of tightening up the blood vessels. And midodrin or proamatine is the most commonly used one. It just gets in there and increases the uh, tendency of the blood vessels to tighten up and maintain the blood pressure. It's relatively short acting, so you usually have to take it at least two or three times during the day. But then if you don't take it too close to bedtime, it will wear off when you lie down at night and not give you as much high blood pressure at night. Droxydopa also tightens up the blood vessels, but it's sort of similar to uh, levodopa. Levodopa, you may know, is one chemical step away from being dopamine. Your brain's short on dopamine and Parkinson's. We give you levodopa. Your brain can make more dopamine very easily. Well, droxydopa is one chemical step away from a chemical, neuro, nerve chemical called norepinephrine. This is what your body releases in those reflexes to try and tighten up the blood vessels. So giving your body droxydopa makes it easier for it to make and release more epinephrine, makes the reflexes that tighten up your blood vessels and maintain your blood pressure when you're standing up more effective. So that can be a useful and relatively short-acting medication as well. Uh, Pyridostigmine, mestinon also acts on a different part of the uh, nerve connections that make up the reflex that tightens up the blood vessel. Octreotide acts to shunt some of the blood flow away from your gut and provide more blood flow for the rest of the body. 
So some combination of these medications can usually help to uh, control the uh, tendency of the blood pressure to drop if uh, you can't manage it with non-medical uh, techniques. So we'll move on to memory and hallucinations. Um, <clears throat> people often get the idea, oh, Parkinson's is like Alzheimer's and you're going to have memory problems right away. Um, really, most people with Parkinson's don't have significant memory problems, uh, at least to begin with. On the average, these start after about 11 years. Um, and medication-related hallucinations can occur at any time during the disease. Uh, people with Parkinson's are more susceptible to developing hallucinations. Dopamine is involved in a reverse way in the perception circuits, um, but it tends to become a more significant problem about the same time that memory problems begin to be uh, an issue. And because of the way some of the medications work, there's often a trade-off between using more medication to uh, move better and having more tendency to hallucinations or more tremor if you're using medications for, for memory problems. So sometimes you have to balance you know, what's more important. It's often better to know where you are and what's going on and maybe not move quite as well than to move well and be very confused. This is just a graph from the Sydney study where they followed many Parkinson's disease for decades. And just showing the solid line is when people began to show signs of memory problems, the beginning of dementia. And you can see there's almost a plateau on this particular graph between about 10 and 15 years. So, uh, and we say on the average about uh, 11 years is where it crosses the 50% line if you uh, smooth it out. Um, but some people out 20 years, you've got uh, one person in five who's still not having any memory problems. Uh, and some people, unfortunately, do develop memory problems sooner. The dotted line or dashed line is when people start having really significant problems with hallucinations. And you can see it very closely parallels when the memory problems start. So <clears throat> from the uh, in paper, the average time to develop uh, begins starting developing dementia or memory problems is about 11 years after Parkinson's starts. And even at 15 years, only 48% have evidence of dementia. So half of the people, even 15 years out, are still doing well in terms of memory. Um, though 36% have what's called mild cognitive impairment, which is the beginning of memory problems. Uh, suggesting that you're going to go into dementia. And 15% are still not affected at all. By 20 years, 83% have evidence of dementia. But as I said, you know, there's still one in five who's uh, doing okay in terms of memory. One of the things that sometimes gives people the idea that there's more trouble with memory in Parkinson's than there really is, is these first three items. Um, people are slowed down by Parkinson's. And so if someone comes in and starts shooting questions at you, you're gonna be slow to answer the questions. Not because there's anything wrong with your memory or your thinking, it's just the motor of getting that uh, response out. You also get a tendency to less facial expression. People think that the person with Parkinson's isn't understanding what they say because they don't see the normal changes in facial expression because Parkinson's affects facial expression. But again, that's not a sign of any memory problem or thinking problem. And again, speech difficulties, people often have soft and slow voices that make it hard to communicate. So for those who are caregivers and in the medical profession, you really have to be patient and careful and assess how somebody is doing in there because they may just be stuck sort of behind the motor symptoms of Parkinson's and their thought processes and memory may be just fine. 
Um, another thing that can be an issue is the movement problem can interfere with writing and drawing tasks. And some of the little quizzes and things that we use to assess memory involve drawing clocks and figures and so forth. And those can be affected by the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, but they're not signs of a cognitive problem. Another big issue is that the chemical changes in your brain of Parkinson's make you much more susceptible to depression. Not to put aside the fact that actually having Parkinson's is uh, kind of a burden that may make you tend to feel depressed. But coexisting depression can affect people's ability to deal with mental tasks, but it's not dementia and can be addressed in other ways and is more reversible. So, as I said, along with the memory problems, you start running into uh, problems with hallucinations. Now, some hallucinations are very benign. People think they see, you know, little pink monkeys sitting in the trees or something like that. They know they're not real. They're not threatened by them. It's not a big deal. You, people want to know that, yeah, this is just the Parkinson's. You're not developing some other kind of real craziness, it's just a misperception produced by Parkinson's. Um, but sometimes people see things that are disturbing to them. A lot of times people end up seeing and having conversations with family members who aren't there, and if it's a family member who died some years ago, that can be very upsetting to people. Or people may see things that are scary, or they may see things that are not necessarily scary, but they can't tell what's real and what's not, and that leads them to act in ways that may not be safe. So if you have those kinds of hallucinations, you need to do something about it. You can get some benefit by adjusting the Parkinson's medications, but uh, a lot of the time you have to use a medication to suppress the hallucinations. And what are called atypical neuroleptics, of the mainstay of treatment, um, but some of the best known uh, atypical neuroleptics like risperidone and olanzapine definitely tend to worsen the Parkinson's symptoms, so we like to stay away from them. Quetiapine and clozapine are most often used. Quetiapine is Seroquel, and a lot of times a little bit of quetiapine will take care of hallucinations without making the Parkinson's significantly worse. Clozapine is even better, but clozapine has a drawback that it can affect your bone marrow and your ability to produce white blood cells, and if that happens, it can kill you. So if you use clozapine, you have to do blood tests, starting out weekly and, and always at least monthly to make sure that the medication isn't causing a problem. Usually it doesn't, but it's a real nuisance having all the blood tests. So clozapine doesn't get used quite so often. The newest thing on the market is Pimavanserin, which is marketed as Nuplazid. It certainly does work for some people. Like every medication, nothing always works for everybody. But Nuplazid can be effective. It's still fairly new and quite expensive. So usually we try something else first. Uh, but it will uh, control the hallucinations in quite a few people without uh, causing worsening of the Parkinson's. And the good news there is there's at least two more drugs in development uh, that will probably be similar in terms of being effective most of the time for hallucinations and Parkinson's without making the Parkinson's worse. Um, so we do have things we can do. Non-motor complications of late Parkinson's, uh, cognitive slowing. Uh, you may not really have memory problems in dementia, though here again, 40% in late stages. Um, but you may just think slowly. The psychosis and the hallucinations we talked about. Depression and anxiety become more common uh, problems in late Parkinson's. And later today, I think there will be more uh, presented about uh, dealing with those sorts of problems. The dysregulation of the blood pressure, which is, includes the orthostatic hypotension that we talked about. 
Problems with the bowel and bladder also uh, become more common. Constipation is present in most people with Parkinson's even from early on, but it can become even more of a problem as time goes on and you can have trouble with an overactive bladder that makes it hard to control your urine. And sleep disturbances are also uh, common in Parkinson's and may become more of a problem as the motor symptoms become worse. Then we come to motor fluctuations. Uh, motor fluctuations are where you go from having too much benefit from medication and some involuntary movements. What one of my uh, patients' uh, son used to call and say, oh, dad's got the bob and weave again, because people start moving around, just excess movement from the Parkinson's medications, particularly levodopa. Uh, and then you go to the other extreme, it's not helping, and you're stiff and you can't move. Should I skip ahead? This is not a real patient, this is somebody dressed up. But this is what uh, the akinetic rigid syndrome, which is a formal description of what Parkinson's does to you, you can feel like you're just bound up and you can't move at all. And that can be very unpleasant. Um, and you get to a point where any medication you take by mouth, it first has to get in, and you get up, and you get a big peak of it in your system, and then it gradually comes down again. So you've got peaks and troughs going on throughout the day, and in advanced disease, you can be very sensitive to the amount of medication that's around and keep cycling between excess movement, which can become severe, to feeling like you're wrapped up in the... Uh, bandages and can hardly move. Um, now, one of the things that uh, we do most often for this is deep brain stimulation. Um, and that can be very effective because DBS in the right place in the brain can do very much the same thing as giving levodopa, but it does exactly the same amount 24-7. No peaks, no troughs. So you can try and get it set to just where you want. Unfortunately, later in the disease, not everybody is a candidate for uh, surgery. If you've got beginnings of declining cognition, you can make it get worse much faster if you go poking wires into the brain to do deep brain stimulation. Or people have comorbid disease. Their heart or their lungs or something can't take it. And they say, no, you're not a candidate for surgery. Um, there's not an absolute age limit. Some of the older literature, you see stuff that says, well, this is DBS is a treatment for people under age 65 or something like that. No, you can have DBS when you're 70 or 80 if the rest of your body's healthy enough to take it. Um, but nonetheless, there are plenty of people who can't have it. Um, the, one of the newer things, been around a few years now and getting a little easier to get hold of, is the time release capsules of carbidopa levodopa. Uh, they will smooth out a lot of the peaks and valleys, but it's still an oral medication. There are some low peaks and shallow valleys. There are things you can do to try and get out of uh, a valley, as it were. Uh, apomorphine, which is an injective injection, has been around for more than a decade now. Uh, it's coming as a non-injected form, but uh, the FDA has delayed that. But there's also an inhaled form of levodopa. So some people get to the point where their medication is going along just fine. They're not due for a dose yet. Suddenly, it's not working. If they take more medication by mouth, it may be half an hour, 45 minutes before it starts working again. You can use something like apomorphine or inhaled levodopa to get going again in 15 minutes. And then the stuff that you swallow will eventually kick in and take over. There's also uh, a mantadine that can help to suppress those involuntary movements when the medication is too high. And you can take it as short-acting form a couple of times a day. Now there are two different long-acting forms that you can take to try and prevent those excessive peak dose dyskinesias. And then finally, another alternative to deep brain stimulation is a continuous intestinal administration of carbidopa levodopa as a gel called duopa. Um, so this is just uh, going over some of the symptoms that happen when the medication wears off. Uh, immobility and uh, 
slowness, which is bradykinesia, are obvious wearing off of the medication. But you can also get dystonia, a kind of overactive muscle uh, condition that uh, causes a, a limb or part of the body to have multiple muscles tighten up and twist into an abnormal position. Or you may just get a muscle cramp in one muscle. Uh, tremor can come back, weakness. You can get abdominal discomfort because your medication is wearing off. Some people get very restless uh, when their medication wears off. Some people become very anxious, not just because they know what happens to them when the medication wears off, but as a direct chemical effect of the medication wearing off. Um, some people get short of breath. You can have swallowing problems, uh, irritability, even pain. So there's a lot of things that happen if the medication wears off that you want to avoid. Um, one way to get around this, again, is these uh, time-release capsules, which give you a very long duration of action and help to avoid valleys where the medication wears off. You want to avoid using the dosing tables that are published with it, and there's some numbers here, but basically some simple calculations you can approximate the appropriate dose to switch to with the capsules. Uh, if you don't, then sometimes people think it doesn't work for them and you just have the dosing wrong. Uh, I already mentioned Duopa, which is this carbidopa levodopa gel. You see here he's holding the, the gel as in the little gray cassette that's plugged into the little pump. The pump plugs into a tube that has to be implanted in the stomach, and that will provide a more continuous uh, <clears throat> carbidopa, levodopa, all day, day long, very, very constant. A little bit of fluctuation depending on what else is going on in your gut, but not nearly as bad as taking individual doses. And finally, I already mentioned you can inhale levodopa for a very quick effect. This has just recently finally come on the market. This little uh, blue and white thing pops open in the middle. You put a capsule in it, you plug it together, pierces the capsule. You put your mouth on the round end of the white and suck in, and it just sucks levodopa right into your lungs and will get you going much more quickly. Wears off pretty quickly, too, but again, gives you the chance for stuff that you swallow to get in through your stomach. Which brings up the issue of swallowing problems. Uh, one of the big issues is if you get weakness in the muscles in your throat, you can aspirate and get stuff in your lungs. And so anybody who's choking or having chronic coughing, especially after meals, you want to do a modified barium swallow, an x-ray swallowing test, and make sure whether or not things are getting in people's lungs. Uh, sometimes people get silent in aspiration. It's getting in their lungs, but they're not coughing or choking. Um, so if a Parkinson's patient gets pneumonia, it's a good idea once they recover from the pneumonia to do the swallowing study and see if they're chronically getting stuff in their lungs. There are different swallowing techniques and thickeners for fluids that can help to keep stuff from getting in the lungs. Uh, so if you find the problem, there are things you can do about it. If those don't work, you can again put a tube directly in the stomach and use it as a feeding tube so that people can get their nutrition without the danger of getting stuff in their lungs and causing choking and pneumonia. And I mentioned, if we go back here, if you look really closely uh, where the tube from the pump connects the tube that's coming out of the stomach, there's a little fork, a Y junction. So the tube that you use for the pump has an access port that can be used as a feeding tube. Um, so if you've already got Duopa therapy and don't need a feeding tube and later you need a feeding tube, you're all set. The other side of that is if you're a Parkinson's patient and you need a feeding tube, it's probably worth putting in the kind of tube that can be used with the pump and so that you can have the option of switching to using the uh, pump. One of the problems with feeding people through the PEG tube uh, is that if you just crush carbidopa levodopa tablets and try and flush them down the tube, you can do that for the short term, but the stuff adheres to the walls of the tube. So you don't get as much into your system as you plan to, and the adhered stuff eventually plugs the tube, and you have to put in a new tube. 
The better way to do it, if you're going to use regular carbidopa levodopa tablets, you crush them up and you dissolve them in water with vitamin C, which will help it dissolve, because levodopa doesn't dissolve very well. Then you get a solution that you can put down the tube. But you have to keep making up solution because it doesn't keep very well, and you need to keep it refrigerated when you're not using it. So you have to make up a new batch every day, keep it in the refrigerator. Now, if you can get the writery capsules, those little beads inside the capsule will flush down the tube very nicely. So uh, if you can get the writery capsules, you can open them up and flush the contents down the tube, and that will work perfectly well. But again, if you're going to need to have a tube anyway, you might as well get the kind of tube that you can use with the Duopa, and then you can get Carbidopa Levodopa from a pump and not have to go through all these uh, conniptions. And drooling is related. Uh, basically, it results because your whole gut is slowing down and weakening, and so you have less spontaneous swallowing. You make saliva all the time, and if you're not swallowing it, it's going to be in your mouth. It's going to be at risk for leaking out. There are a number of different medications that can be tried to decrease this. A number of the medications that are used if you have overactive bladder, trouble controlling your urine in Parkinson's, will also tend to reduce your uh, saliva production, which is, can be a handy side effect. Or glycopyrrolate uh, can be used specifically to uh, try and reduce the production of saliva. Sometimes people use the little scopolamine patches too. The problem is that uh, all of these things can cause more problems with memory and with hallucinations. Um, and they can counteract the effects of some of the central acetylcholinesterase inhibitors that people use to try and prevent memory loss. So again, you get into a balance. Would you rather uh, remember where you are or would you rather drool? Um, there are some things you can put directly in the mouth to try and dry, dry up the saliva. But again, you have to be careful about that being absorbed systemically. If the drooling is a real problem, the best thing to do is actually inject botulinum toxin directly into the salivary glands. And that will decrease the activity of the salivary glands for three to six months. Um, so the only drawback is you have to have injections uh, a number of times a year to keep the saliva suppressed. So final topic, hospice care. Uh, why hospice? Uh, you, know, you think of hospice more for terminal cancer, but home hospice, number one, can provide more help at home that's not covered by regular insurance. You can skip futile care for severe infections, heart attacks that uh, are not really going to uh, necessarily help, help you out and put your care into keeping you comfortable and dealing with the Parkinson's. Uh, financially, it's much less of a burden if you go into hospice. And if you do have pain problems, hospice patients have much better access to pain medications. So this is from a study looking at goals of care and uh, <clears throat> querying uh, the relatives of people who went through uh, uh, hospice care. 87% had a healthcare proxy, so someone appointed to make uh, medical decisions for them. 92% had a living will about not going through uh, extreme uh, measures late in life. 79%, almost uh, four out of five, mostly wanted comfort care. Only 6% really wanted life prolonging care at that point. Uh, CPR to try and resuscitate people was not performed on any of the patients. 26%, a little over a quarter of them did have tube feeding. So sometimes people think, oh, I can't go into hospice because I can't swallow and I won't be able to have a tube and I don't want to die of malnutrition or dehydration. No, that's not the case. You can, if it's appropriate, have a tube when you're in hospice. Um, and a third of them got some form of breathing support. Um, and 74% felt that the wishes regarding medical treatments were followed. And 56% of the caregivers reported that their loved one received hospice care for a median of three weeks.
Satisfaction with hospice care is very highly ranked from people who have received it, and the problems with complicated grief are alleviated by satisfaction with hospice, and increasing satisfaction with information provided about symptoms and management is also associated with hospice services. Long-term care non-hospice uh, <clears throat> survey showed that 40% of Parkinson's patients died in a skilled nursing facility or other long-term facility. Only one in four died at home. Uh, 35 died in an acute hospitalization, 35%, um, as opposed to folks in hospice are much more likely to uh, be able to die at home, which is a goal of many people. Uh, nine Parkinsonian residents of long-term long care facilities died without any significant family or friends in attendance, uh, while people who were able to remain at home had at least one significant person with them at the time of death, another important goal for many people. Uh, so you get some real benefits by going into hospice care when the time comes, and that's all I had to say this morning. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Ah. Dr. George, do you know when that University of Washington study was done? Uh, that was, I believe, about six years ago. Another question. Um, I'd like to know when you intervene with the um, orthostatic uh, hypertension, how many episodes do you um, consider uh, before you seek some kind of medical intervention? Well, it, it depends on what you consider an episode. Um, if people are passing out or falling, you want to intervene, even if it's only once. If you know that for sure that that's what's causing the the falls or the passing out. I mean, you do have to check that people aren't having heart rhythm problems or uh, having seizures or something. Uh, but it, once you're sure that that's what's causing the problem, if you're having a severe enough problem to fall or pass out, you want to deal with it, how, whatever it takes to get it under control. Um, if you're just having lightheadedness when you get up, you can try, you know, going along and just getting up more slowly and being careful. Uh, the other thing that comes up, sometimes the orthostatic hypotension event is clearly related to dehydration, uh, particularly in hot summer months. So that's another thing you have to watch out for. So you don't want to do a full court press unless you're sure you've got an ongoing problem. But if it's a significant problem, you want to deal with it because people get severely hurt from falls. You, yes. you talk about people having constipation and that. What do you do if you have colonic inertia? Um, it, it depends on how severe things are. I, when uh, the, the colon is, is really inactive, sometimes you have to resort to, to enemas. But in everybody with Parkinson's, you want to be putting stuff through the gut all the time that will keep the stool nice and soft so that it takes very little gut motility to have uh, the stool progress and, and get through. So most patients, uh, a little bit of uh, Miralax or uh, lactulose syrup will keep the stool soft at all times. And you can adjust how much you need to take so that it uh, is a soft stool but not runny. Uh, but you want to be doing it every day. You don't want to wait for things to plug up. And then sometimes, if that's not enough to keep things moving, you can use stimulant laxatives and then extreme measures only if you need to. So another question? With, with, with the use of the uh, Ritary capsule, you can't see me over uh, here. Over there. <laughs> yeah. And um, they are having some difficulty swallowing that but don't have a peg tube. Can that capsule be opened? And is when you open it, is it absorbed just as well as if it's swallowed? Yeah. You, you can open the capsules and dump them into applesauce or something like that that's easier to swallow. That works just fine. 
a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about palliative care and the difference between, and I actually know the answer, but I'd like to hear you say, <laughs> palliative care and hospice, and when palliative care is appropriate for a Parkinson's patient? Well, I'm not sure if you're uh, using the same definitions that, that I am. Palliative care, to me, includes the whole gamut, including hospice. Um, but the goals of palliative care are just to keep people comf comfortable and so forth. Going specifically into hospice changes your financial arrangements. When you're in hospice, your health insurance will not pay for you to get acute care for a heart attack or something. Um, all of the resources are funneled into comfort care when you're in hospice. Pal a palliative approach can be used even without going into hospice. And there are different levels of uh, palliative care that you can use depending on what's appropriate for you at the time. It is possible also, people do sometimes, go into hospice care and then something new arises and they really want to have it worked up. It is possible to come out of hospice care and get acute care if your situation changes. Uh, doesn't happen that often, but it's not a wall that you can't get back over. Yes? I had uh, fallen twice the past two weeks, but basically I've fallen backwards, and it's just all of a sudden uh, there I'm laying on the floor, and uh, hard for me to get up. Mm -hmm. I have a U-step walker here, which is really a, a good walker, and my wife has used that to help me get up. You know, because I'm laying there and, and it really helped us and I'll call for her and thank God she's around to help me up. So, yeah, so actually that's one thing. The uh, reverse action brakes on the U-step mean that you can use it to help you get up, whereas if you've got a rollator, you can't use it to sort of climb up once you're down because it's going to get away from you unless you can reach up and get the brakes locked. But if you're suddenly finding yourself on the ground despite using a good walker, that's when you really want to be suspicious that there's a problem like orthostatic hypotension. You're suddenly either just losing all your muscle strength or you're suddenly losing your awareness to grab hold of the walker and present, prevent yourself from falling. And that may be because of a sudden drop in blood pressure. So that needs to be checked out when those circumstances arise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's actually, I mean, I don't know, uh, other people who don't have Parkinson's occasionally pass out even very briefly for other reasons, and that's exactly the experience you have. You're walking along, and next thing you know, you're lying on the ground looking up at people, looking down at you, saying, What happened? So, uh, you, you got to consider that orthostatic hypotension may be the culprit or one of the confounders of orthostatic hypotension where people lose consciousness for other reasons. Next question. We've got one over here. Can you address medication for sleep issues? We're in a big support group and everybody has sleep issues at night. So yes, there are medications for sleep issues, and there are a lot of sleep issues in Parkinson's. Uh, Parkinson's makes you more susceptible to restless legs, and that has one set of medications. It makes you more susceptible to sleep apnea, and that sometimes medication helps, but usually you need to use the uh, CPAP machine to uh, provide extra air pressure and keep the airway open. Uh, many people with Parkinson's develop what's called REM sleep behavior disorder, where they start acting out their dreams and often are doing violent things and they're asleep in the bed, but they're thrashing around. They can injure themselves, they can injure bed partners, they can smash the bedside lamp, they can fall out of bed and injure themselves. And there are other medications that are useful for that, one of which is clonazepam, and a lot of people think of clonazepam as a sleep medication, but you can also get insomnia. Clonazepam is not a great medication for insomnia. Some people, it'll help them fall asleep, but mostly clonazepam at night you want to use for the REM sleep behavior disorder. 
Um, there are other medications you can use as well, including very high doses of melatonin. Melatonin is a good medication for helping people get to sleep. You don't need as big a dose as you need to control REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, and again, a lot of people get insomnia and can't fall asleep. A lot of people are waking up in the night because their Parkinson's medication wears off and they're too stiff. Normally, people roll over in their sleep. That's normal and you need to do that because your body doesn't respond well to having pressure on the same part of the body all night long. But if at the point where you would normally roll over in your sleep, your medication is worn off and you can't roll over in your sleep. The next thing you know, you wake up and you're very uncomfortable. And um, so that's a different problem and has to be handled by addressing the Parkinson's medications in the sleep. Also, the uh, problems with overactive bladder uh, are particularly exacerbated by the some of the things that are related to orthostatic hypotension, where you end up having to go to the bathroom to pass urine much more frequently all through the night. And again, there are things that can be done for the bladder and to uh, alter the production of urine, including just, you know, you need to drink lots of fluid with Parkinson's, but not so much after bedtime. So depending on what the sleep issue is, different things need to be done. And there's at least a dozen medications I could mention for different <laughs> sleep problems in Parkinson's. But you really need to get to the root of what kind of sleep problem is going on. Thank you, everybody. We're out of time. I know you have more questions, but we're out of time this time um, for this session. Um, thank you very much, Dr. George. Thank you again.